In this lab session, we're going to apply our knowledge of digital design, Verilog, and simulation to tackle a new theoretical concept, binary multiplication. It's important for us to practice building different types of design, as after all, digital design is a means to an end, so we need to get some experience of taking ideas from a concept through to practical realisation. Before we get started on binary multiplication, it's definitely worth us running through decimal first. It's probably been several years since you had any formal tuition on it, and as everyone has their own way of doing multiplication in their heads, we could do with all starting on the same page. Plus, there are distinct parallels to draw between the two methods, as well as various terminologies which could do with explaining. There are many different ways to notate multiplication, but the process itself remains the same. Multiplication is defined as the addition of a number to itself, as often as is indicated by another number. This process consists of two values. The number to be multiplied is the multiplicand, and the number to multiply by is the multiplier. Throughout this video, I'll be using this colour coding to make things easier to remember. Multiplicands are yellow, and multipliers are blue. So let's take a look at how we multiply decimal numbers. When we multiply single-digit decimals, we usually do this by rote memorization. When we were young, we will have learned our times tables, telling us what one number multiplied by all others are, and we can easily reproduce any combination under 10 without writing anything down. We're still adding a number to itself multiple times, it just so happens that we remember the answers to 100 or so combinations. When we multiply larger numbers, we're still adding our multiplicand to itself again and again until we reach the value of the multiplier. However, this process of repeated addition is by no means the quickest or most efficient, particularly when we're multiplying two numbers with more than a couple of digits each. Instead, we use the technique of long multiplication. We start with the smallest digit of the multiplier and multiply each digit of the multiplicand in turn. As we've learned our times tables, we just pull the results of these single-digit multiplications from our memories. We don't actually need to do any adding. If the result of this multiplication is greater than 9, we carry the number of tens units to the left. For the next unit of the multiplier, we repeat this process, except this time we left-shift the result one place. Each of these parts of the final result is known as a partial product. We continue this process of multiplying and left shifting for all remaining digits of the multiplier and end up with a cascade of partial products. Then, to reach our final result, we simply add up each column, carrying over any excess units to the next column on the left. Where we have these empty spaces, they're simply counted as zero. So this process allows us to complete a multiplication of any two decimal numbers, simply using addition and a rote memorization of our times tables from 1 to 9. When we move over to unsigned binary multiplication, we just apply the same technique. Like in decimal, we need to memorize some single digit times tables, but luckily our binary times tables are incredibly simple. 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, and 1 times 1 is 1. So again, we start with the lowest digit of the multiplier and multiply each digit of the multiplicand in turn. With the simplicity of our binary times tables, we either end up writing our multiplicand again or just a line of zeros. We then move on to the next digit and left shift the result by one. We continue this process for all digits of the multiplier. There'll be a number of occasions where the partial product is just a line of zeros. It's important that you still include this in your working, just so you can easily keep track of the left shifts. So once we've generated all of our partial products, we can add up the columns to get our final result. Remember here that we're adding in binary. 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2. It equals 1, 0. We end up very quickly with carries, which, like in decimal, are added to the columns to the left. The only real difficulty we have here is keeping track of multiple digit carries, which sometimes requires careful thought. Once we've added up all of these columns, we can convert back to decimal to check our answer. So it's really that simple. We follow the exact same conventions as decimal multiplication, just with fewer times tables to remember. Pause the video now to test this process out and see what you come up with for the values stated here. I've purposefully picked values where all bits are 1, so that we can establish the maximum width of an output for a given input. This will be useful to know when we come to build a multiplier in hardware later on in this session.
so you should have come up with the answers displayed here. And from these we can derive a general rule for the maximum output width of a multiplication, for output x and multiplicand and multiplier widths n and m respectively, the mat's width of x is equal to n plus m. So we've established how we can multiply unsigned binary numbers. So let's try following the same concept for signed binary and two's complement. We'll generate our partial products and then add up the columns to get the results. So in this example, we're multiplying minus 5 and 7, but the answer we get here is minus 51, which isn't even vaguely related to the two input numbers. The same process simply doesn't work without any alteration. To multiply two signed numbers, we have to extend the sign of the multiplicand and the multiplier. This process involves infinitely repeating the most significant bit of each of the values in the columns to the left. We then generate our partial products based on this sign extension. So with sign extensions, our addition stage ends up being quite complicated. We've got several columns with three ones in before we even begin to add carries, so we need to run through this slowly and methodically. So we'll start by filling in the zeros for the three columns on the right, just to make the additions nice and easy. And we'll begin with the furthest column on the right. So in this column, there's just a single one. So the sum for that column is one. Over onto the next column, we've got two ones. And of course, one plus one in binary is one zero. So we'll write that down at the bottom. Now, of course, we can only fit the lowest unit in this column. So we'll leave it as zero and carry the one into the next column on the left. So taking the third column into account, we can see that we've got two ones in this column already, which gives us a subtotal of one zero. But we've also got to take this carried one into account as well, which changes that to one one. And again, we need to sort out our carries, so we'll leave one in that column and carry the one into the next column. We can repeat this process for the next couple of columns. We've just got two ones in each of them, and this carry is going to propagate forward until we get to the sixth column. Now, in the sixth column, we've got three ones already, which gives us a subtotal of one one before we deal with any carries. Adding that carry to one one gives us a value of one zero zero, and of course, we can't really carry that straight into the next column. So we can split it up. We keep a zero in this column, carry a zero to the column on the left, and then carry a one to the column two on the left. Then as we move into the next column, we've got three ones in there, which generates a one one. And then we've got this zero carried, which we don't really need to do anything with, so we just get rid of it. So again, carry the one into the column on the left, which has already got a one in it. So we add the one and one together to make one zero and carry on to sort of rippling the carries through the columns on the left. You'll see after this point, we kind of end up in an endless loop of adding a one and then carrying one zero, which indicates that we've actually reached the end of our calculation. We're now just adding in the sign extension for the answer, so we can just kind of leave it there. Our additions result is infinitely long, so when do we know when to stop? Well, we know from the unsigned multiplication that the maximum length of our output is equal to n plus m. So we take that number of bits as our result. Everything on the left of this can be discarded. So in this example, we're using a 4-bit multiplier, so our output will be the 8 least significant bits of the result. So now when we check our answer, we can see that we've got minus 35 here, and the calculation has worked correctly. Being able to follow a similar methodology in both unsigned and signed means that in theory we could create a single multiplier circuit to handle both unsigned and signed numbers. All we'd need to do is to tell it whether or not to perform the sign extension. In the next screencast we'll be talking about how to implement just the unsigned multiplier, but as part of future lab tasks you'll need to adapt this to be unsigned. In preparation for this, and potentially for our tests in a couple of weeks' time, make sure that you can run through these methods on pen and paper, as they'll prove crucial to understanding how these multipliers are actually designed.